Let's turn to the Gospel of John chapter 4. The Gospel of John chapter 4. And I'm going to be reading a very familiar passage here, verses 3 through 26. And let's just allow the Word of God to speak to our hearts this morning. He, Jesus, left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria, so he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back here. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship. You worship what you do not know. You worship what you know. For salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is not here when you worship it. Worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to Him, I know that Messiah is coming. He is the Father of God. When He comes, He will tell us all He said to her, I who speak to you. Father, we ask your blessing upon your word this morning that you, God, would speak to our hearts. And you will enlighten us through this beautiful kind of Jesus and this Samaritan woman. We ask, Lord, for your spirit to work in our hearts and point us to the truth. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to begin with this sentence. Jesus said to this Samaritan woman, the Father is speaking. I love that. I want us to pause right there. Because if you notice, John writes that Jesus had to pass through Samaria on his way from Judea to Galilee. Now, geographically, Samaria was by far the most direct way to get to Galilee from Judea. So geographically, it was the the most direct way. But there's a more important reason why Jesus had to pass through Samaria. Jesus had to pass through Samaria because the Father was seeking this woman. The Samaritan woman was one of those whom the Father was seeking. I love that picture. The Father is seeking. The Father is still seeking. Jesus came to seek and to save 
the lost. Before we sought God, God sought us. Do you know that? Before, before you sought God, He sought you. He sought me. We would never have come to God if He had not first come to us. Jesus said in John chapter 6, He said, No one can come to Me unless the Father draws him. If your heart has been drawn to Jesus in faith, you didn't originate that. The Father drew you to Jesus. You came to Jesus because the Father drew you to Jesus. The Father worked in your heart, began to open your eyes, began to stir faith in your heart to see your need to be saved and your need for a Savior. And then you look to Jesus and like the thief on the cross who said, there is, there is something about this man. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And your heart said the same thing. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I believe in you as my Savior. Well, that was God working in your heart. That was God opening your heart. The Father is Jesus. For the next several weeks, I want us to be in a series called Spirit of Truth. Jesus said the Father is seeking those who worship Him in spirit and truth. Not just spirit, not just truth, but spirit and truth. I want you to, the, the illustration came to my mind, you think of a plane. An airplane has two wings. I want you to think of spirit and truth as the two wings of a plane. You've got one wing is the spirit, one wing is the truth. That plane needs both wings to stay up and fly correctly. I mean, a little over a year ago, a small Cessna was flying along and it lost the wing and it crashed. And if we, a believer at church, misses a wing, if we lose one of the wings or the other wings, we are going to go into a tail spin. We need the wing of the Spirit. We need the wing of the truth to keep us balanced, to keep us uh, soaring, to keep our faith from traction. If a believer, if a church, if a movement, and, and there are whole movements that are in danger of crashing because they have become unhitched from one or the other, unhitched from the Spirit or unhitched from the truth. And even healthy churches can struggle with getting both right, tending to emphasize one or the other. So this morning, I want to kind of introduce this, and then we're going to we're going to be looking at some things, including some, some things that I believe are concerning in the church at large. Not because I want to be hypercritical, I want to be gracious, and I want to be uh, kind about what we There are some things that are going on in the church that are concerning and are causing literally some believers' faith to crash. And that's going to happen if the wind comes off of truth or the wing comes off of spirit. But this morning, I want us to just kind of examine Jesus' statement a little closer. The Father is seeking worshipers. That's what the Father is seeking. He's not seeking debaters. I can debate the gospel. He's not seeking spiritual know-it-alls. He's not seeking people that have all kinds of scholarships and everything. He is seeking worshipers. Worshippers. Worship is a central theme to this passage. In fact, what happens is, and the woman brings it up, when, when Jesus tells her, if you knew who this was, you'd ask him for a drink and he would have given you living water. She is like, hey, I'll take some. I'll take some. I mean, I think she had the wrong concept. I, thought, I think she thought she'd never have to come back to the well and draw water. But she's like, yeah, give me some, Jesus. I'll take some right now. And so Jesus says to her this very leading statement, you go and call your husband and come back. And so she's like, I just want to get to that water. I have no husband. And Jesus says, you're right. You have no husband. You've had five husbands. And the man you're living with now is not your husband. So 
it's kind of, it's almost comical. This, this woman, you can tell, this is how like a little uncomfortable, you know? Um, she's like, okay, so I can So, um, let me see the stuff to Let me bring up a that's been going on between the Jews and the Samaritans for as long as history has been. And let me bring up a debate because there's nothing that changes the subject better than bringing up a controversy. So she says, uh, hey, you know, uh, uh, you Jews say that you have to worship in Jerusalem at the temple, but our fathers said we worship here at the mountain. And so here's the controversy. Jesus kind of moves around that controversy by saying that where and how people worship is about to be changed forever. Who worship, he said, would be located not on a mountain, not in a temple, but in spirit and truth. You won't need to go to a physical place like a mountain or a a temple or a church in order to worship. You need to go to spirit and truth to worship. That's what the Father, he says, is seeking. Worshippers who worship in spirit and truth. The word, the Greek word for worship is prosteneo, and we get the word prostate from it. It gives you an idea of what worship is. It means to bend down, to, to kiss, to prostrate ourselves before God. Not physically, although 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 the scripture is full of of encouragement to express our worship to God physically. Because there is something about physical express, expression that unleashes more of our heart. So the Bible says, bow down before the Lord. It says, raise your hands to the Lord. Clap to the Lord. These physical expressions help, because we're body, soul, and spirit. We, these physical expressions help to unlock and unleash and, 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 and enhance our worship. But the deeper meaning of it isn't that we are constantly bowing down and bending down physically, but that our hearts are in constant submission to God. That we are in constant reverence to God and His will. When our desires bump up against God's desires, we submitly depress our desires in order to uplift His will. We bow down before His name. When our pride wants to exalt our name, when our pride wants to exalt us, we have to say, Father, you give the glory. Jesus, you do honor. The Father is seeking those who submit themselves in reverence and obedience to God wherever we are and wherever life is for us. <clears throat> so worship includes, but it is more than what we did just now, singing songs in church on a Sunday morning. If that's your, you know, yeah, I worship 10 minutes, 15 minutes a week. That's not what all that worship is. We worship God wherever we are. Wherever life has us, we worship God in how we treat ourselves. We worship God in how we parent our kids. We worship God in how we do our job. We worship God wherever we are. When we trust God with our lives, that is a form of worshiping. When we live with integrity, or we seek to live with integrity, that's worship. When we when we when we seek to live with justice and kindness in heart, that's worship. In fact, Malachi chapter six, verse eight, God says this: He has told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly. With your God. You see this beautiful picture. What does God want from you? That you walk humbly with your God. That is, like you walk low. You humble yourself. You, you prostrate yourself before the Lord. And part of that is then you do justice. You do what you 
We worship God by letting Him do work on our hearts at the deepest level. I mean, the most hidden parts of motivation. And, and yes, we are commanded by God to gather together, and it's a beautiful thing that we get to gather together in the name of Jesus Christ as the Lord's church and to lift our voices in song and to express our worship to Him and take communion together and enjoy fellowship and listen and hear the Word of God preached and loving one another. All of these parts are worship. They're all worship. And the goal of worship is is not to make ourselves feel better about ourselves. I think that's a side thing. I think we do get a better understanding of who we are. I think we do get our hearts awesomely encouraged by God. Sometimes we get our hearts convicted by God, and we should, and we feel we feel low and we bow low before God. In 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 this weep for him and, and call out for you know forgiveness and repent. <clears throat> But the goal of when you say, what, what am I going to church for? The goal should not be, I'm going to church so I feel better about myself. You know, so I feel better about my life. That's not the goal of church. The church is that we glorify God. Amen? The goal is that we glorify God with our lives, with our church, with what we do. <clears throat> the Father is seeking worshipers. And then Jesus goes on to say, who worship in spirit. And the word spirit is pneuma. And we know that word, pneumatic, and it means breath or wind. And so Jesus in in that word, he could mean he could mean worshiping with our human spirit. My spirit is engaged in worshiping God. Or he could mean the Holy Spirit. I mean the Holy Spirit. I'm worshiping in the Spirit of God. I believe he means both, but I think primarily, in context, we see that primarily he means the Holy Spirit. And the reason I say that is because in verse 13, you remember he says to the Samaritan woman, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water I will give him will be coming in like a spring of water willing up to eternal life. Now, John chapter 7, the Gospel of John chapter 7, Jesus tells us that the living water is. In verse 37, it says, On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, same thing, thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Come to Jesus and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. You hear the, you hear the, you could just lay that over John chapter 4. Thirsty, come to me. I will give water. It will flow out of you. And then John has this commentary. Now he said this about the Spirit whom those who believed in Him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit, Holy Spirit, had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So I believe when we overlap John chapter 4 with John chapter 7 and this well of water flowing, we see that we're talking about the Holy Spirit welling up within us. The Apostle Paul also confirms this in Philippians chapter 3, 3, when he says, For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God. How do we worship God? By the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit enables us to worship God. Without the Spirit, our worship won't be the living water welling up. It'll be like a well that's gone dry. It'll be as dry as, as a desert. Our worship will not well up. My grandmother, my great-grandmother, used to have in her house, which has now been torn down and is a parking lot there. Reminds me of like a, a stone. But um, on the side yard, it used to have one of these old fashioned pumps. Remember those things? And you would pump them and the water would come out. I don't think her pump worked anymore because I'd be out there pumping and nothing ever came out. Maybe it just needed to be primed. I don't know. But um, but that's what we would be like, like that pump where no water. We could we can put the handle. Let's 
Let's get the music. Let's turn it up a little louder. Let's get the drums. Let's dance around. Without the Spirit of God, we're just pumping the handle, but nothing's coming out. We need the Holy Spirit to enable our spirit to worship God. We need the living water coming in for the for its worship of God. So if our worship is a cold, cold formality, if we, we look and, you know, believers are all over the spectrum. We're not like a crazy emotionally uh, driven church, and I don't really want us to become that. But we also don't want to be like emotion is a bad thing. You know, like we don't want any emotion. We want emotion. Amen. Amen. Y'all with me this morning? We want it. We want emotion. We want joy. We want tears. We want love. We want happiness. We want conviction. We want to, you know, express our worship to God. And we need the Spirit of God to help us to do that. And 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 as I said earlier, worship is not just like what we're singing. It's like to go home and worship God by how we treat our spouse, how we treat our kids, how we work at our job. See, that, that, that living water, it's not just supposed to, oh, it's, it's 10 o'clock, let the living water flow for another 20 minutes, and then let's turn it off for a week. It's supposed to flow. How you do your job is a worship to God. You do your job with integrity. You have a good work ethic. Your boss can rely on you. Your, the people that work for you know that you're not like down on them and always trying to make them look bad or take credit for what they do. All of that is a worship to God. When we go in and we're trying to, I want to cut, cut corners. I want to get great. I want to take credit for what my coworkers have done. I want to, I want to, you know, rule and be harsh towards people because I'm over them and everything. We're worshiping ourselves. And what people see is ourselves. They see us. And they're like, no. And, and, but when we worship God, people see the Lord in us. We worship, it's got to go into our heart in spirit. So I believe our spirit's engaged with the Holy Spirit so that it's really deep within us. I want to worship God. I want to love God. I want to know God. I want to serve God. I want to pray to God when I'm driving somewhere. I want to pray to God when things are going great. I want to call upon God when things are going hard. I want to, my spirit to be moving with God and speaking to God and hearing God and letting the Spirit of God search me and know me, see if there's any wicked way in my heart. I, don't, I want to be aware of who I am. I want the Spirit of God to be a light on who I am and what's really going on in my heart so I'm not walking around with all kinds of image, but nothing really gets into my heart, and I really don't even know who I am or what I'm doing or, or who God is, because it's got to start there. We've got to start with, Lord, search me and know me, that I might have you, that I might worship you in my marriage, in my parenting, in my workplace, in my relationship, in my church. True worship is honest, self-aware, and God-centered. The Father is seeking true worshipers who worship in spirit. And then Jesus says, and worship in truth. In truth. Samaritan woman is about ready to have the living water. Just give it to me, Jesus, please. But Jesus says, he applies serious truth to her life. Give it to me, please. Bring your home into this thing. I have no husband. And Jesus brings truth to her. And I want to point out, he does not bring it harshly. But he also doesn't cut the corners. In fact, he brings truth there in a way that it makes it easy for us to hear and not feel defensive. He says, you're right. You're absolutely right. You don't have a husband. You have had... She didn't tell the whole story, did she? You have had five husbands. And now you're living with someone who's not your husband. And you guys, that, that's impressive even for a lot of people. 
how many people do you know that have six? Five days ago, five days ago. That's a six person. See, that's that's in a bad way. That's in a good way. That's in a good way. And I see it. But what I want to say is, On this mountain, ever since we got cut off, we're, we're cut off from the Jews. We don't like each other, but we're not going to go to Jerusalem to worship. So we set up our own Jerusalem at this mountain, and we're worshiping God. It's fine here. Your father says you have to go to Jerusalem to worship. Now, before Jesus redirects her, he tells her he brings truth. You guys are wrong. You guys are wrong. You worship what you don't know. The Jews worship what they knew know, do know. Because salvation is from the Jews. Salvation is, is it's not just healing. It's based on fact. It's based on truth. The historical fact of Jesus, the Son of God, entering history and time as a man to live, to teach, to suffer and die, to rise again for our sins. That's not allegory, brothers and sisters. We know that. That's not metaphor. That's not myth that helps point us to. That is fact. That is history. These things happened in time and history. And Jesus says, I am the only way to the Father because objectively He is the only way anyone can be saved. There is no other name given under heaven by which man can be saved other than the name of Jesus Christ. That is fact. That is truth. And so the Bible is called the Word of Truth. The Gospel is referred to as the Word of Truth, the Gospel of your salvation in Ephesians chapter 1. Jesus refers to Himself as the way, the truth, the truth, and the life. So to worship in truth is to build our worship and our faith on the Bible, on the Gospel, and on Jesus Christ. And all of these things always point us to Jesus Christ. Jesus is the truth. The Bible speaks to us of Jesus. And the Gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. Everything points us to Jesus Christ. If we don't tether our worship of God to the truth of God's Word, we will go into tailspins. We will be vulnerable to deception. We will be uh, vulnerable to error. If it just sounds good and feels good, we're like, I'm in. I've never felt so good. I've never heard teaching that made me feel so good. Well, that could be good. But you've got to go to truth and say, does it line up with the truth of God's Word? Or you will get into trouble. And so will I. Our worship is enabled by the Holy Spirit and is anchored by the truth of God's Word. If you're gonna, if you bear with me, I want to share one more airplane illustration with you, um, because I saw this. No intention of using it in the message at all, but I saw it, and it just—it's very sad, but it just—it just also was fascinating to me, and I thought it also represents a truth here. Just a few weeks ago in Mexico, a small plane was hired to to do a gender reveal. And so the party is all there. The couple is in front of this big thing that says baby. And the plane flies in low. And as it comes over this big, this big sign that says the baby, it releases smoke and confetti and it's 
pink. And so it's saying girl. And so everybody, the couple hug and kiss and everybody, but the guy filming it films the camera and no sooner does the plane get over the crowd, but the left wing just goes up, just flies up. And the plane goes into a spin and then the second wing flies up. So now it's it's actually up, but it's down because now the plane is upside down with both wings pointing down. It crashed not far from that party, killing the pilot. When someone, I, I don't want to say a believer, I don't want to say a church, but anyone, any person, any church or group or gathering or movement, when any buddy loses one wing, it's not going to be long before they lose the other wing. Two. A church that is all about the Spirit. It's all Spirit. But never cracks the Bible open. Never goes to truth. They're, they're going to lose the Spirit too because the Spirit is called the Spirit of truth. The Spirit's job isn't to give us goosebumps. It's to point to Jesus Christ. It is to take the things of Christ and bring them and bring light to them and open our eyes so that we see Christ more clearly by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God never points to Himself. He points to Christ. So if you've got a group that's all Spirit and we're barking and we're shaking and we're moving and we're seeing people fall, like I was talking about, I think yesterday at our breakfast, um, I went to a meeting where they were trying to be drunk in the Spirit, mishandling a few and five, and so they're, they're, sh- they're laughing and they're, they're slurring words and they're stumbling about and everything. Now listen, and this is where I want to be gracious, because we as believers can be nothing else. Amen? Come on, you can do better than that. Amen. I know I'm, I'm a nothing else. We've been working on that. So I don't want to, like, we can get things wrong and God in His grace and patience will bear with us. So, yeah, and, and we all have this wrong to some degree. I get it. But if, if you go so far down the road that it's all spirit, all spirit, all spirit, this manifestation, and this sensational thing, and that supernatural thing, and, and this thing, and that thing, you're eventually going to not end up with the Holy Spirit, test the Spirit, John writes, because His primary job is to do what you're not doing. He, if He is truly, powerfully working in you, He is going to be powerfully pointing you to Christ. He's going to be powerfully pointing you to the Word of God. He's going to be powerfully pointing you to truth over and over and over again. And if you're not interested in any of those things, then whatever spirit is moving and shaking and got you barking is not the Holy Spirit. But on the other side of it, God's Word, a church that emphasizes God's Word, I mean, I want to be careful here, but if it's all God's Word that you know, I believe that falls into the category of the form of God's Word, but lacking the power thereof. Spurgeon, The Word of God only does its work by the Holy Spirit. We are only saved by the power of the Holy Spirit. Applying the, the work of Christ to us, regenerating us, making us alive. It's not the information in the Bible that saves us. It's not the information of the Gospel that saves us. That information is absolutely necessary. We need truth. We need truth. 
But that truth alone has no power to save you apart from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ working within us and saving us. We must be born again. Jesus said, the Spirit, like the wind, Now, the reality, the reality is most churches that love the Lord, that love Jesus, and love the Word of God will probably get it wrong to the degree, but be right in the whole. There are churches that love the Word of God, they love the Gospel, they love the Holy Spirit, but they don't have much emphasis on the Holy Spirit. Maybe some are even afraid of the Holy Spirit, and maybe partly because of some of the abuses that have been done in the name of the Holy Spirit. But they are not setting out the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit of God is working. And you have churches that might be a little bit wild and a little crazy and a little bit emphasis on the Holy Spirit, but they, when, you, when, you, when you hear their hearts, they love Jesus Christ. They believe He's the only way to salvation. They love the Word of God and they preach it. So, we all, none of us get the best of what we do. You can get into deep trouble. And in our pursuit of health, we want to have both wings working correctly. Amen? We want the Spirit. We want the truth. The Father is seeking those who worship in spirit. And true. So as we close this morning, I want to ask the, the band, all two of them, to come back up. And here's the thing: I don't even think this song really even relates to this. Song. I don't like. I don't think it's like a real connection. I didn't intend. But I just want us to enjoy. It's a new song for us: the goodness of God, because that's that's what the Lord's drawing us to. The gospel is good. The Spirit of God is good. We don't have to be afraid of the Holy Spirit. The Word of God, the truth of Christ, our Jesus is good. Amen? And so, and you know what? One of the beautiful benefits of worshiping Him in spirit and truth is the goodness of God. It's it's, it's how we taste and see that the Lord is good. Maybe you came in dragging this morning. Maybe you're like, I don't even want to be here. Life is, you know, this is going on, that's going on. I've got worries, I've got fears, I'm depressed, I'm this and that. I hit somebody running on the way in. Whatever it might be. And so your heart is there. And But as we worship and as we remind ourselves of the goodness of God, we taste and see that wherever your life is right now, the Lord is good. And sometimes we need to forget where our life is right now and just taste and see that the Lord is good and feel the refreshing of that.